Hi everyone, this is Evan Perkins, Vice President with Competitive Energy Services. Thank you for joining us today for our discussion on UMass Amherst Campus Microgrid and their efforts uh, to scale renewable energy on campus over the last few years. I'm here today with Zach Bloom, uh, also Vice President at CES and Steve LeMay from UMass Amherst. Uh, today we'll be talking about what makes up UMass Amherst's campus microgrid and what the campus has been doing over the last five to 10 years uh, to scale uh, its decarbonization efforts across campus, in particular installing on-site solar, the largest behind the meter system in the Commonwealth, plus uh, a number of battery storage projects. So with that, I'll hand it to Steve and he'll give an overview of what's on campus. Hello and uh, welcome. My name is uh, Steve LeMay. I'm the plant manager here at the University of uh, Massachusetts Amherst Central Heating Plant. So here's a look at what we have here for our campus. We're at 28,000 plus students, 1,300 full-time faculty, 5,000 staff members. Basically, we're a little, little city here. 11.8 uh, million square feet of building space on campus that was maintained. As Evan mentioned, we're the largest public energy user in the Commonwealth. And we are research in intensive, which uh, drives reliability needs for the, the campus uh, for research. So we do have a small microgrid here, starting with the central heating plant, when, which is also connected to um, the Tilson substation, which 115 kV substation we put in in 2014, which we'll give you a quick picture of later. Um, and then we have some generation here inside the, uh, the um, central heating plant as well. Uh, so for electrical, you can see our, our total electrical for uh, FY20 is basically 140 million kilowatt hours. We produced about 71% of that. We purchased the other 29% of that. So we do have a lot of internal uh, production capability here to keep this microgrid going and, and reliable. Um, let's go inside the CHP, Evan, the next slide. So this is what's inside the central heating plant. We have a, a Mars 100 gas turbine putting out 1100 megawatts. We've had that upgraded over the years. We have two steam turbines uh, putting out two megawatts for the, the first steam turbine, four megawatts for the second steam turbine. We have four package boilers here to maintain the, the steam load to the campus. Campus peaks somewhere around 330,000 pounds per hour in the heating, during the heating season. You know, in order to try and maintain some um, efficiency here, we have this gas turbine with a, a heat recovery steam generator to recover the exhaust from that generation. And then one of the newest things that we've added that's on our chart here inside the central heating plant is a 1200 horsepower fire tube boiler. We're hoping to use that in the future to burn biofuels as we uh, transition the campus um, to greener energy. So we have had put some, some uh, plans here as well to install additional ones if needed. These could also be run as hot water boilers in the future. Any one of these uh, units that we have here for combustion equipment can burn either natural gas or ultra low sulfur diesel fuel. Um, we want to go to the next slide. This kind of shows that it's, we're predominantly a gas plant. That's what we're, most of our BTUs come from, you can see there. We back it up with LNG. In the winter months, we can go as high as 10,000 uh, decatherms a day. Typically, Berkshire Gas can give us 5160 decks a day. So in those days where we need a, a hedging fuel, LNG is our first choice. Ultra low sulfur diesel is our last choice, and we only use it when we're curtailed 100% from natural gas, which Berkshire Gas can do here 15 days a year. And um, as you can see, we put out slightly under a billion pounds of steam last year in our electrical production. Most of that um, steam use, you can see here, 85% is used for heating the buildings out there on the campus. We have about a 6% loss in our heating distribution system. It's about 27 miles of steam and condensate pump piping throughout the campus. So we do have some losses in that system. And then we use another 9% in-house process, the aerated steam heating, the central heating plant, things of that nature. So that's a pretty good view of what our energy mix here is. And we'll go to the next 
So really that's our, that's our Kilson substation. That was the, uh, the beginning of reliability here for the university and our future for electrification. We have two tran uh, transformers out there, 50 megawatts a piece. And uh, now that we're on the transmission system versus the distribution system, that's helped our reliability and our capability for electrical. So I think uh, Evan and Zach are gonna talk a little bit about some of our challenges related to uh, bringing all these renewable on campus, particularly the solar and integrating it to our microgrid. Thanks, Steve. Uh, yep, so Zach Bloom, Vice President, Head of Sustainability and Renewables at CES. And we've been working with UMass for about a decade here, you know, each campus and the system. And starting in about 2015, we, as a system office, really started thinking about how do we get more and more on-site renewable energy? And so UMass Amherst had already done a, a study identifying multiple locations for both parking lots and rooftops that might be suitable. And the, the first kind of entry point at a, a larger scale was at their visitor center where they did a parking canopy in that instance, it was a, an outright purchase, kind of a design build. And to be able to actually scale at a, a much larger amount of on-site renewables, UMass decided to actually go out to bid uh, for multiple locations and get a lot more scale. So the first system was you know, less than half a megawatt. And what UMass Amherst you know, needed to do because they had that substation was really understand that they can export back into the grid. So there's a lot more considerations that were involved for integrating both the, the solar into all the, the microgrid kind of setup that Steve had, uh, had reviewed there. So the first project, which was done as a, a power purchase agreement was completed in 2017. It was two separate parking lots uh, in total four megawatts and multiple rooftops that scaled up to, to one megawatt. So a total of five megawatts were installed um, as phase one, and, and that was completed back in 2017. As the, the next phase, to be able to really deal with some of the intermittent generation issues, especially in the winter time when the students weren't there and it got real sunny out or in some of the, the shoulder seasons, we really needed to think about instead of curtailing the on-site solar, how can we, you know, saturate or store some of those additional electrons or have more control? So once the ACES grant went out, the, the state of charge report in Massachusetts put out there, UMass was very interested in integrating on-site storage into the, the microgrid. So they did an RFP you know, selected vendors submitted for a, a grant to the state and ultimately awarded Borrego as the, the installer. And they used lysian batteries, a 1.32 megawatt, four megawatt hour lithium ion battery and worked with IHI uh, to do the integration. It, just to note here though, e even though they worked with the developer and the integrator, UMass Amherst actually owns and operates the system. And so it's really looking not at how does the vendor or developer think the battery should be used, but what makes the most sense both financially and operationally for UMass Amherst. So that, that project's now operational and has been for a, a couple of years here. And what's currently kind of in process and planned to be fully completed this year is the next phase. So instead of doing two separate ones here, there was an RFP you know, designed under the SMART program to have both on-site solar and battery storage. And so this will have a additional three megawatts of parking canopies and a two megawatt, four megawatt hour battery uh, as the next phase here. So you can see we're, we're definitely scaling up pretty quickly. And what we'll get into next here is a, a little bit of some of the, the solutions that were implemented. And I'll hand it back here to, to Steve for a moment, just to talk about why it was done this way and kind of how it all interacts. So uh, one of the things that we'll find is particularly on weekends, we would end up having 
more generation, more solar. So we had to come up with a way to manage this solar so that we wouldn't trip our gas turbine off, but maximize solar. So we do have a uh, curtailment scheme in place that if there's too much solar, it will take off 250 kilowatts at a time, give the operators a chance to get the gas turbine back down to the appropriate loads to handle that solar and uh, make it an easier transition for us as we're, as we're working through uh, situations where we'd have excess generation. And our next big project was as part of that uh, 2014 substation, we uh, separated the campus east side, west side substations and then so then we didn't have access to that generation that was happening on the uh, east side generate um, substation. So we put a duct bank in and brought everything back together and connected the campus and uh, both substations back together to give us access to that generation that was on the east side as well as the load on the east side so we could keep producing power and uh, maximize our opportunities for solar generation, particularly on weekends off hours. And the battery storage was uh, certainly helped us quite a bit when it comes to peak demand, being able to store some solar or store energy from overnight and discharge that during peak capacities and help us manage our load. And then will help, uh, certainly help us going forward as additional solar generation comes on on the campus. But it's been a, a certainly a, a learning experience to get all of these coordinated properly and get them running properly in uh, conjunction with the campus generation and the uh, reliability needs. So with that, we're gonna talk a little bit about, uh, we'll call it the second challenge. Uh, there's the the day-to-day -day, um, requirement to have technical solutions in place to make sure the on-site solar generation plays nicely with the, the combined heat and power system in the central heating plant that's all solved today through technical solutions like steve said it's a mix of being able to move power around campus better through the duct bank using curtailment schemes as a as a last resort uh, if we do see excess generation and we're trying to move those curtailment schemes away to be able to store that energy now in batteries instead of just wasting it a key question as we are looking at setting up those technical solutions and thinking about how these different technologies would interact with each other is simply how to pay for all of this. Uh, if we move to the next slide, you know, one of the key things that CES has been helping UMass think about and be at the forefront of is taking advantage of different uh, state and federal incentive opportunities as if they have come about here for both solar and battery storage. When we look at the last couple phases of projects that we've put in place on the campus. Uh, each project is shown on the slide here has really leveraged every possible value stream coming from both the state of Massachusetts and uh, the federal level through uh, primarily the investment tax credit. So I'll just talk through each of these here quickly. Uh, the first phase of solar canopies, uh, the parking lots and rooftop systems, we structured these as a third party financed and owned system through a power purchase agreement specifically to be able to take advantage of the federal tax credits. UMass uh, as a nonprofit state, aid, state agency cannot leverage that incentive directly. So we had to have a third party own the system to be able to leverage those tax credits. That obviously posed some questions of how you would be able to implement curtailment schemes effectively on equipment somebody else finances and owns so we had to work through in the contracting process how to sort of harmonize uh, that uh, piece of the project to make sure that UMass retained full discretion on when these solar systems could operate to make sure excess generation wouldn't risk campus utilities. On the battery storage project with Borrego, uh, like Zach said, we saw a great opportunity come about because of the ACES grant program back in the 2017 timeframe state put up about $20 million worth of demonstration pilot funding. Uh, UMass was at the front of the line, uh, both Amherst and a couple of the sister campuses to take advantage of that uh, grant funding, which was pretty important at that time since the technology was still relatively expensive, especially compared to pricing we're now seeing today. The most recent phase, again, you know, thinking about how we can leverage federal incentives, uh, UMass Amherst is developing these new solar canopies and the new battery uh, using a PPA structure where a third party has financed 
the system, uh, both the battery and the solar, uh, and will own those for a period of 20 years. Uh, that plus allowing that uh, owner to charge the battery fully from the on-site solar from the new canopies has enabled UMass to basically take advantage of the tax credit value that the ITC offers for battery storage if it's co-located with solar. So in each case, we had to think through the ownership structure, the financing structure a little bit differently to one, make sure Steve and his team had the right control uh, structure in place to be able to make sure all their assets could operate reliably along with the central heating plant. But also, you know, there was a lot of incentive money out there. So I think we've done a good job taking advantage of every possible value stream to get the end of day purchase price as low as possible for the university. So if we go to the next slide, you know, the battery storage piece here, the leveraging those incentives and value streams uh, has been a process uh, for everybody involved. And I think we've done quite well. And there's a good story to tell here. Prior to the ACES grant, you know, battery storage in Massachusetts with pricing, you know, five, six years ago, it would have likely taken more than a decade. You know, the graph here, we show a payback at about year nine for this four megawatt hour system, which cost about two and a half million dollars. With the ACES grant, that payback projection dropped almost in half to about a five year projection. And at that point in time, UMass uh, decided to finance the project directly with that five-year payback target in mind. Since that decision, a number of other value streams have come into place and are now available for battery storage that's behind the meter in Massachusetts. Uh, so UMass, at the end of the day, was able to achieve a payback under three years. It just took over uh, two and a quarter years and was achieved this past fall. So it's really a story about looking for early advantages and taking advantage of incentive opportunities and then thinking about whether you know, policy trends are going to continue favoring certain technologies to position yourself as best as possible. And I think uh, the campus has done extremely well in this regard uh, for battery storage and solar. If we go to the just next. to note there, you know, Evan, the, this, this program, you know, as Evan kind of reviewed, would have been a nine year payback, but with the grant it's five years and only about 50% of the savings, you know, that have been realized came from what was originally identified. Where the other 50 plus percent came from new programs like the, the daily dispatch, you know, connected solutions program and additional legislation that the state put out for the clean peak standard. So a lot of that negotiation, even though those programs weren't in place, were done in mind with a really evolving landscape for battery storage and making sure that UMass could monetize additional revenue streams if they did become available. So thinking about you know, how Steve's guys operate the battery day to day, looking at the next slide, we have a couple of value streams that the existing battery and the new battery will be pursuing. These value streams, i.e., you know, when to discharge the battery to generate either bill savings or program revenues, it really depends and varies by season and by time of day. So CES helps Steve and the operations team uh, put together a discharging and charging strategy. We send daily communications looking at these different value streams and making recommendations on when essentially to pull the trigger on the battery. Uh, these have added up to discharging, you know, between 125 and 250 days per year. And with the first battery, the Borrego battery today, we're looking somewhere around $700,000 per year uh, in savings expected. Next slide before we wrap up, uh, looking at the most recent phase of projects, uh, the smart and solar, uh, solar plus storage project, it was really all about leveraging the state incentive here. Uh, solar canopies are a wicked expensive way to do solar when you compare it to uh, ground mounted, uh, especially utility scale ground mounted systems. Uh, we were able to basically get more than half of the project paid for through this 20 year smart incentive rate, which really gave the campus a lot of flexibility to, to design a control um, scheme for the system that sort of best suits integration into the microgrid. Uh, so SMART uh, was a very helpful program in this regard uh, to get this last phase of the project done. So Steve, you want to bring us home on the summary slide with some of our lessons learned? Sure. 
So some of the lessons learned here. So we are one, we are the largest behind the uh, meter solar installation in the Commonwealth without reliability issues to date, knocking on wood. So, <laughs> so it, that's, the project has been very successful and the coordination between CES and our team has, has been outstanding. So those are key, you, you have to have that or it's gonna be difficult to maintain your reliability. You know, it's scaling intermittent on-site renewable energy generation can be addressed. There's a lot of mixed solutions as you see here as we go through how we're trying to manage this between solar, battery, and some other renewables here coming in the future. State and federal incentive programs are the key to, you know, cost effectiveness, particularly on these batteries and the solar projects. And uh, battery storage costs have, uh, have uh, fallen. The incentives are, are there to, to make it happen. So without that, it would not be possible. And we thank the CS team for bringing us through a lot of this and the financing and pulling some of these projects together. And with that, I think we will wrap up. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, all. Appreciate Thanks, everybody. it.